Well, if you have your Bibles with you, please uh, do keep it open at John's Gospel, chapter 11, as we continue our short series on a, a series of encounters that Jesus had uh, with people uh, that he meets uh, that's recorded for us in John. Well, let's ask for God's help to understand his word afresh. Let's just pray. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, you are the Lord of light. Make pure our hearts that we may see you. Reveal yourself to us that we may love you. Strengthen our wills that we may choose the good from the evil and day by day manifest in the world the glory and the power of your name and your gospel. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Angus Cloud, 25. Sinead O'Connor, 56. Tony Bennett, 96. Coco Lee, 48. What do these superstars have in common? Well, they all died in July. I wonder what went through your mind when you heard about their passing. Maybe you thought, well, wasted potential, or what an unexpected tragedy, or you might miss their talent, or they just had lived a good long life, isn't it? Or maybe you didn't think much about their deaths at all. After all, lots of people die every day, and unless it's someone close to us, we tend not to think about it. It's something that happens to someone else and not to us. And also tends to happen out of sight, isn't it? And what's out of sight also tends to be out of mind as well. And instead, we just occupy our minds with a thousand other things, uh, more immediate things. Maybe we occupy our mind with the state elections, or the stock market, or office gossip, or K-drama, or football scores, or, or, and so on and so on. And it's precisely this, according to the French philosopher Blaise Pascal, he says that it's precisely this, that's the greatest tragedy about death. In Ponce, a collection of his thoughts and observations, Pascal wrote this. He says, they fear, the people in general, they fear the most trifling things, foresee and feel them. The same man who spends so, much, so many days and nights in fury and despair at losing some high office or at some imaginary affront to his honor is the very one who knows that he is going to lose everything through death, but feels neither anxiety nor emotion. Pascal goes on to write, it's a monstrous thing to see the one and the same heart at once so sensitive to minor things, but so strangely insensitive to the greatest things. In other words, he's saying, look, isn't it human nature that we spend so much time to rage and to worry and to despair over what he calls trifling things, but don't spend much time to think or to feel about weightier things, like death. Death is a problem that looms large. It casts a large, huge shadow over our lives. Death is going to rob you, rob you of everything you've ever accomplished in life. Rob you of whatever that you have accumulated in life. And it will suck out the enjoyment of everything in life. Because the more you love something, the more pain and hurt you will feel when you lose it. And you will lose it all one day. And so death is shouting from the rooftops daily about the reality of human life. And yet, oftentimes, we've closed our ears and our eyes and our hearts to its cry. Do you know what Angus Cloud and Coco Lee and Tony Bennett and Sinead O'Connor's death is saying to us? We are not too important to die. We are not too rich to die. We are not too young to die. We will all die. And just like everyone else we know, and the world will just keep moving on. Just as it always has. Because there will be another Angus. 
There will be another Coco, there will be another Sine, there will be another Tony to take their place because no one is indispensable, no one is irreplaceable, no one is forever. And it's only when we lean into this harsh truth this morning, when we listen intently to what death is saying to us, then we can appreciate, we can long for, we can recognize the magnitude, the relevance of what it is that Jesus is offering to us. And this is what Mary and Martha, the grieving sisters, will discover in their conversation today. Their beloved brother, Lazarus, has died, and we're going to hear Jesus speak into their sorrow, into their grief, and into ours as well. Well, we first look at verses 1 to 6, where John sets the scene, if you like, for this meeting. Jesus got word that his friend Lazarus was gravely ill. You see that in verse 1, back in Bethany, and his sisters have sent word, in verse 3, sent word to Jesus for help. Now, what did Jesus do in response? Now, look down with me to verses 5 and 6. It says there, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Now you think this, oh, that doesn't sound right, doesn't it? Verse 5 says Jesus loved them, so you would expect that verse 6 would say, well, Jesus dropped everything. Jesus left immediately for Bethany in order to help and heal his beloved friend. Because by now in John's narrative, we know that Jesus had already healed the paralytic, he'd already healed the man born blind, he's even miraculously fed 5,000 people in the wilderness. And all those people were mostly strangers. So it's not unreasonable, it's not implausible to expect Jesus to do more for his beloved friend, to restore Lazarus to good health straight away. And yet our text oddly doesn't say that. Instead, it says precisely because Jesus loved them that he delayed going. That's odd, isn't it? That deliberately, Jesus deliberately chose to delay two more days out of love. Jesus waited until Lazarus was well and truly dead before he bothered to go to Bethany. And he knew he was dead because in verse 11, he says, our friend Lazarus had fallen asleep. Now, why did he wait? Was it because he didn't care? Well, no. Verse 5 tells us he loved them. Was it because Jesus couldn't do it? He had to somehow, you know, wait a while, recharge his powers, if you like? No. In John chapter 4, Jesus healed an official's child long distance, instantaneously, effortlessly, with just a word. He just told the official, your son will live. And his son was healed, far away, mind you. But what we do know is this, as revealed in our text that God's delay is not incompatible with God's love. That God's delay is not incompatible with God's love. God delays answering our prayers. Our prayers for someone to be saved. Our prayers for someone to love. Our prayers for someone to be healed. For some debt to be paid. God delays answering our prayers, good prayers. He delays them because... He has an even greater purpose in mind to fulfill in our lives today. God delays because while we might be asking him again and again for a good thing, he actually wants to give us the best thing. And that's why he withholds that good thing for a season. He wants us to thirst for, long for, be receptive to receive something even better. And we're told he does this because of his great, committed, unwavering love for us. And what is it that he wants to give to us? Well, we're going to see in the next conversation, he actually wants to give to us himself. Now, before we move on to the conversation, think about this. Do you know this, friends? Maybe you too have been waiting. Waiting for a long time. To, uh, you pray and you pray and you pray, and, and yet you have yet to receive an answer. And maybe you begin to think to yourself, well, God's not real. Why does he not answer me? Maybe he doesn't care. Maybe he doesn't love me. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm not trying hard enough. Well, the answer is no, no, no. It's all not true. The actually answer is actually here. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. 
You see, Jesus already knew how Lazarus' life story would end, even though Mary, Martha, Lazarus did not. He knew. In verse 4, you go back. He says, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the glory of God, so that God's Son may be glorified. So God delays not because he's trying to punish us for some vice or he's waiting to reward us for some undone virtue. In this case, he delays because of his great love for us, that he wants to give us what we truly need because oftentimes we're not always wise, not always know what is the best thing that we should be asking for. And what we need more than anything else, according to Jesus, is to see his glory so that we may believe in him. That's what he says in verses 14 to 15 when he told, spoke to his disciples. He says, he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead and for your sake I'm glad I was not there. Why? So that you may believe. So what is it that they're supposed to believe? What, what, what is this glory that they're supposed to see? To answer this, we turn to Jesus' conversation with the sisters in verses 17 to 37. Now, at, at the very beginning, in verse 17, we're told that Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days when Jesus arrived. Now, why this particular detail? Well, scholars speculate that it's likely because of a popular superstition in Jesus' time, that a person's soul, if you like, would hover around the body. You know, when a person dies, his soul separates and would hover around the body seeking re-entry, seeking a kind of reunion during the first three days after death. But on the fourth day, when the decom decomposition sets in, when color is drained away from the body, the spirit soul, if you like, gives up its quest and will finally leave for the afterlife. It won't haunt the body anymore. And so that's the significance of the four days. In other words, the soul has finally left. This is not going to be a resuscitation. This is not even going to be a healing, a restoring someone to their health. This is unequivocally unmistakably, absolutely the point of no return, dead. And for the sisters, it means that the hope of any recovery for Lazarus, any healing, that hope has died. And what remains is just the heavy sadness of missing someone deeply. And like everyone who grieves, everyone who grieves, we all tend to look back with regret. Our despair can sometimes trap us into a kind of emotional cul-de-sac. We go round and round in circles, not able to find our way out of grief. When we have lost someone, we often, that's, that's how our mind works. We often think, if only we had done this, if we only had done that, if only we had seen the doctor earlier, if we only we had responded to this thing earlier, if only, if only, if only. And that's what both sisters said to Jesus, you notice, when they met him. They independently, they echoed one another in verses 21 and verse 32. They both met Jesus separately, but they said the same thing to Jesus when they met him. You see in verse 21, Lord, or verse 32, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If only, Jesus, if only you had answered our call earlier, if only you had answered our prayer, if only you had responded earlier, things would be different. It won't be this tragic end. But now, Jesus, you're too late. It can't be fixed. We have lost what we love forever. But you see, while the two sisters were saying the same thing to Jesus, Jesus actually didn't respond to the two sisters in the same way. You look down at, to Martha, Jesus replies in verse 23 to 26. This is the conversation he has with Martha. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? But you look down to verse 33, when Mary says the same thing to Jesus, what was the reply? Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. 
Verse 34, where have you lain him? He asked. Come and see, Lord. They replied. Jesus wept. Now, what's the difference? What's going on here? Well, I think the late Reverend Dr. Tim Keller puts it well. When he wrote, well, to Martha, Jesus gives her a ministry of truth, while to Mary, Jesus gives to her a ministry of tears, a ministry of truth and a ministry of tears. In other words, to Martha, Jesus is helping her by guiding her to a deeper truth. Yes, she says, everyone is going to be raised again to face God together on Judgment Day. So, in a sense, Martha has a kind of textbook belief about a future resurrection. But you see, this belief hasn't really penetrated her heart. This theological truth hasn't yet really comforted her. Why do we say that? Well, because when she came to Jesus, she actually wasn't looking forward to that future day of resurrection, no. She's actually disappointed that Jesus missed this present day of Lazarus' death. And that's why Jesus kind of redirects her focus. I am the resurrection and the life. In other words, listen, Martha, here's a deeper truth and a greater comfort. The theological truth that you're holding on, that you're believing in, you're hoping in, well, it's here, it's now, it's me. I am the resurrection. I am life. So whatever you hope for, whatever you wish for, is actually not found out there, is actually not found in the far future, it's actually found here and now in me, in Jesus, the person of Jesus. And that's why Jesus delayed coming. He brought his friends to grieve because he wanted them to see him, to have their hope in him, to not have their hope in some kind of restored physical health, to have some kind of procedure that will happen, uh, but to believe in the life-giving life creator God himself, Jesus. Another scholar puts it this way when he observed, it is because Jesus loved them that he allows death to run its awful course. It's because Jesus loved them that he allowed death to run its awful course. Because Jesus loved them, he wants them to believe. His love for them means not preventing all pain. You hear that? His love for them means not preventing all pain, but doing what's best for them. They go on to write, he goes on to write, what's best for them, as Jesus defines it, is that they believe. And for them to believe, for them to see Jesus for who he is and cling to him with everything, they need to come face to face with the horrible reality of death. And so to Martha, Jesus is guiding her to a deeper truth. But to Mary, Jesus does something different. To Mary, Jesus is showing her God's deeper truth love. You see, when Mary falls at his feet weeping, what did Jesus do? You notice Jesus actually doesn't give her a kind of theological lecture. He doesn't give her a kind of, well, here's the truth about resurrection. I'm going to give you the doctrine of resurrection. He doesn't tell her, well, you're wrong uh, or you lack faith to feel so upset. You know, don't stop your tears, Mary. Don't be silly. Actually, Jesus hardly says anything to Mary at all. You find in verse 34, he was actually speaking to those with her. Where have you lain him? They replied, come and see. And then we see verse 35, Jesus responds, Jesus wept. Now, were you surprised by this? And if you're not, why not? Why not? Because this is quite unexpected. Why? Well, you will never hear a verse in the Quran that says, Allah wept. Or you never hear any sort of, uh, in the Lotus Sutra that says, the Buddha, after he achieved enlightenment, the Buddha wept. No. And considering of all the people there, only Jesus alone knew how this day is going to end. He said so four days ago, or perhaps more, before he came to Bethany. In verse 4, he says, the sickness will not end in death. In verse 11, he says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, and I'm going there to wake him. So Jesus knew exactly how this day would end. 
And yet he wept. He knew that Lazarus would rise again. He knew that death would lose. He knew that life would win. So imagine, for example, like you know, two tennis players, you know, they, they're heading into the court, their names are being announced, and they, they head into the Wimbledon final in center court, and one player knows for sure that he will win at the end of the day. How do you imagine how would they enter into the court when they announce his name? Would, I mean, he'd be brimming with confidence, isn't he? He'd be strutting around without a care in the world. Uh, he'd be smiling, perhaps winking at the camera. He'd be waving happily at the crowd, just soaking it all in. And yet we don't see any of this cockiness with Jesus in Bethany. Why? Because Jesus was not thinking about his own personal victory. Jesus was entering into Mary's grief. He was sharing in Mary's tears and the tears of the people around her. He was entering into her experience and not thinking about what he is going to do. And this is what King David alluded to when he wrote Psalm 56. Psalm 56 in verse 8, I read from the uh, English Standard Version. He said, King David writes, you have kept count of my tossing. So he's talking about, you know, when he's going through this difficult time, and you know, when you go through difficult time, you can't sleep, isn't it? And you toss and turn in bed. And yet he's saying that God, you have kept count of my tossing. One, two, three, you know, like 5,064. You've kept count of my tossings, and you put my tears in your bottle. Are they not recorded in your book? That's amazing. Like the God in the Psalms, Jesus here does the same thing. He doesn't dismiss our grief as theological ignorance. He doesn't dismiss our grief as a evidence of our lack of faith. No, he pays attention to them. He listens to the cries of our hearts. That's why we cry, because our feelings are so deep that words are inadequate to express them. And it says he carefully keeps track of it. That's what the psalmist says. He collects them in a bottle. The tears that you shed, drop by drop, he collects them in a bottle and he records them in his book. So he doesn't dismiss our pain. He, God enters into it and he takes it personally. Friends, I wonder whether you know this today. Is that your God? It matters because Jesus shows us a better way to deal with grief and loss. Because, friends, there will be a time and place for a ministry of truth, yes. Wrong beliefs, denial of truth can lead us into a spiritual dead end, can lead us to destructive habits. But sometimes we need or we can be a loving friend to tell What's what? To tell our friend or to receive from our friend the truth, the unvarnished truth. But there is also a time and place for a ministry of tears. Because deep griefs, grievous losses, deep hurts, they can't be easily fixed overnight. More, you know, if you have experienced deep hurts in your life, more theology while it's true, more words, they can't help heal those wounds straight away. It just takes time. And so in those times, we need, or we ourselves can be, a loving friend to just be with somebody, to be present so that those who are hurting, those who are grieving, they don't feel so alone, so helpless about the future or hopeless about the future. So truth and tears, friends, are not mutually exclusive ministries. They are things that we can exercise to one another. Truth without tears, truth alone without tears is not always loving. Because if you rebuke someone without love, it merely hardens the other person's heart to willingly accept what is right. But while tears without truth, on the other hand, if you just have tears alone without truth, it's not always helpful. Because love without truth just indulges a person's heart to continue in their sin or to be perpetually trapped in their grief. So both truth and tears are necessary, 
And it takes spiritual maturity to know when each is best. And there will be an appropriate season for each. But what we see is Jesus responds to us individually. He knows what we need in whatever season of our lives. But finally, we hear the short conversation that Jesus has with Lazarus. And it is a kind of, well, it's a one-sided conversation. Jesus does all the talking. But the curious thing is, twice now, John tells us that in Jesus' encounter with this, that he was deeply moved. You find that in verse 33, that when uh, Mary came, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, it says that he was deeply moved. In verse 38, it's the same. When Jesus stands before Lazarus' tomb, it says that he was deeply moved. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. Now, actually, there is something unusual about this that's not evident at first. It's because it's in the Greek text, the word John used was more akin to anger than to sorrow. That's the surprise. In other words, that when Jesus saw all of these people weeping, when Jesus was standing by the graveside, he wasn't so much as moved to tears, but actually he was furious. He was raging with anger. He was deeply moved. Now, why is that? What's going on? Was Jesus angry at Mary because she was making such an annoying commotion with her ignorant tears? No. Was Jesus angry at Lazarus for his sin? You know, that's his lack of faith, you know. Uh, serve you right, let you, to, let you to your premature death? No. More likely, Jesus' rage was due to seeing what sin had done. That's why Jesus was angry. This is, he sees the people weeping. He sees Lazarus' body or you know, the tomb where Lazarus is. So what he sees is he's seeing what sin has done to ruin his people and to destroy his world. Why do we say that? Well, consider where did death come from? How does death exist? Why does death exist? The Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. That's what you get. Death is what you get because of sin. Romans 6, verse 23. A wage is a payment earned for work done. So what do we earn from our life's work that God views as sin? It is death. So what Jesus, he sees here when he's standing at the tomb is the fruit of sin. Death, weeping, pain, loss, mourning. Sin has ruined everything God has made. Sin is the thing that has robbed humanity of joy and purpose and life. And Jesus says he is the opposite. He is the resurrection and the life. He has the power over sin and death. And that's why he can command the dead to come back to life. Lazarus, come out! And we're going to hear Jesus say that to us too. You are going to hear Jesus call out your name one day. Come out. And Jesus did this so that everyone can see his power and glory and believe in him. Now one more thing, one final thing about Lazarus. I just wonder, when Jesus told Martha, for example, that he is the resurrection and the life, Jesus made clear, actually, that he meant today, not some future day. That's what Martha assumed. It's going to be some future day forward. Uh, but Jesus is actually saying, no, no, it's going to be today. I am the resurrection. I am here. I am now. I am life. I am resurrection. And the raising of Lazarus proved that point. Lazarus doesn't need to wait for some future judgment day for resurrection. That day begins the day that Jesus came. Now consider for a moment this. Imagine for a moment this. How might Lazarus live out the rest of his new risen life. Yes, he's going to die again because he's still awaiting a future eternal resurrection in the new heavens, new earth. But in the meantime, if you were Lazarus and you were raised from the dead, 
how would you live out the rest of your natural life? Would it still be, do you think that you'll still be the same old, same old Lazarus? Do you think you'll still go through life with the same fears, with the same sinful habits, with the same temperament even? Or would literally coming back from the dead change you? I would wager, because we're not told, but I would wager that the risen Lazarus would be different, isn't it? Because for one, the risen Lazarus, the resurrected Lazarus, would have far less fear about death. Isn't it? Been there, done that. Far less fear about what other people might do to him. Because that's the threat of death. That's often the big threat. He might probably have more hope as he goes through the ups and downs in life because he knows that there's a great reversal that's going to come. He'll probably have even greater boldness in his witness for Jesus. He has experienced, has seen the glory of God. He probably also, I'm guessing, he also would have less despair about loss and about aging. He'll have less despair about that. I'm having some despair, but he will have less despair. You know, because he knows what it's like to come back from the dead. So I imagine that Lazarus will grow old quite gracefully. I imagine that Lazarus will embrace aging with all of its aches and pains. And he will enter into it more fully with hope rather than desperately clinging on to kicking and screaming at his diminishing youth. Don't you think so? Lazarus will literally embody what the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 when he's talking about, you know, the, when he's talking about loss and, and, and upcoming death. He says, therefore, even though, you know, your outer body is wasting away, in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16, he says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So Paul says, 2 Corinthians 4.18, So we fix our eyes on what, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And this is what I think truly believing in the resurrection life will look like. I have to remind myself that in my aches and pains. As Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Friends, do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that this life begins today and not some future far off day? And what will this belief look like in your life? How will you live this life differently believing in the risen Christ. How will today be different? Let's pray. Oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, forgive us on how short-sighted we are in life, that oftentimes we are consumed by trifling things, by temporary things, and have no thought and no feelings about eternal things. Forgive us, O oh Lord, and by your Spirit, renew our hearts afresh so that we might feel the weightiness of the consequences of sin and the greatness of the promises of the gospel. Help us, O oh Lord, to believe and to live in this resurrection life that begins today. That even though all who believes in you will 
die in this life, but we will be raised again. And that begins not in some far off future, but in today. Strengthen us, we pray, by your spirit, through your word. Enable us to hear your truths. Encourage us by your people that we might live this life and embrace it more fully, day by day, beginning today. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.